Hi there. Welcome back to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock, and it's been a really weird week for me so far. What's that joke? How do you make God laugh? Have a plan. And the older I get, the funnier that joke is to me. So my plan this week was to attend the Cornell Hemp Field Day in Geneva, New York. I even had a hotel reservation and everything. But Monday night, we got word that there was uh, a convicted murderer on the loose in our neighborhood. Like literally in our neighborhood. Out in the woods where I like to go hiking. So the next two days were pretty weird. We were under shelter-in-place orders, and there were helicopters flying overhead. Yeah, strange days indeed. And so you probably have heard by now that they caught the guy. Um, They caught him yesterday morning around 8.15. That's Wednesday, September 13th. Um, They caught him uh, about a half a mile from my house right behind uh, a place called Little's where they they fix our lawnmower occasionally. So uh, a little too close for comfort. Um, I am glad it's over, obviously, and I'm thankful that my family is safe and my, my community is safe. I am super grateful to the agents and officers who tracked this guy down and caught him. And I have to say that I am very thankful that they did not kill him out in our woods. You know, we don't need that sort of mojo out in the woods of South Coventry. So anyway, I didn't go to Cornell, and I'm a little bummed out about that, but given the circumstances, everything is fine, you know, like everything is fine. I had even considered not publishing a podcast this week, but I've changed my mind because I don't want to leave you hanging. And besides, last week I went to a hemp field day in Maryland, right, and I I conducted a couple of interviews, and I want to share those with you. So today we're going to hear my conversations with Andy Bennett from Heart Hemp Company in Frederick, Maryland, where last week they hosted a really wonderful event. You know, I saw some great stands of hemp. I think on the field we were, there was about 60 acres there. Um, They did a harvest demonstration. They had one of those fiber cuts from uh, Hemp Harvest Works. And, uh, it was a, you know, a good event. It was um, an educational event for a lot of folks there. There were area farmers. You know, Heart Hemp is trying to encourage their local farmers to get involved. So we're going to hear my conversation with Andy Bennett. Um, I also had the chance to reconnect with Bert James. He's a crop consultant from Kona PUS and Fiber X. So we're going to hear that conversation as well. Um, But before we get into the hemp stuff, I want to share um, some other interviews with you um, with my neighbors, Tom and Crystal. So while we were all in lockdown with choppers flying overhead, I wanted to hear how the people around me were doing. So... I went over there and I sat with them at their picnic table and talked to them for a little bit. So I wanted to share that with you too. Um, Before we get into that, I just want to make a note of our our generous sponsorship. Uh, This week's show is made possible with support from IND Hemp in Montana and Impactful Ventures in Massachusetts. I am very grateful to have the support of these two companies uh, that are making a difference in the world. So check out IND Hemp at indhemp.com and check out Impactful Ventures at impactfulventures.org. That's M-P-A-C-T-F-U-L ventures.org. Okay, so here we are getting into the show. And, you know, I don't mean to dwell too much on this escaped convict story, but it was it, it affected me in quite a way. Uh, definitely rattled my cage a bit. At the time, I didn't feel scared that I was going to be murdered or whatever, but um, once it was all over, then I realized sort of how much tension I was holding in. Uh, but it was freaky. And the whole story is is just fascinating to me, how this guy escaped from from the prison by crab walking up the wall. You know, you, you would have thought the, the prison people would have, you know, made sure things like that didn't happen. Um, and then he escapes. He uh, The watchful eye of the guy in the watchtower was not watching the guy escaping from prison. And then the guy finds a, a truck with the keys in it, and he drives it up <laughs> up to, to my neck of the woods. And then he eventually, you know, finds an open garage with a loaded gun. And then he gets shot at by the homeowner, and he, and he misses. So it's like this guy had incredible luck on his side. And from what I understand, he... He had been on the run before, and he knew how to survive in the wilderness. Um, Not that the woods of southeastern Pennsylvania are anything like, you know, let's say the Amazon. 
but it's some rugged terrain, um, although probably the worst thing you're going to get out of these woods is poison ivy. But anyway, uh, <laughs> don't mean to dwell on this too much. I just need to, you know, process it a little bit here with you. So anyway, we're going to talk to Tom and Crystal. Can you first tell me your names? Crystal Simpson. Tom Cartwright. All right, I'm going to get closer. Get closer. <clears throat> So, um, you're my neighbors. You're my neighbors. And we have like a fugitive in the neighborhood. What was that like? Like what, what was your day like today? Tom, uh, talking. tried to go to work and there's a cop down the end of the street with pretty much AK-47. Can't go anywhere. Turn around, go down 23. Can't go that way either. <laughs> so I just came home and that's pretty much been my day. Uh, basically, at 5 o'clock in the morning, I heard trucks backing up, which woke me up. Um, I've been nervous all day, looking over the fence. Um, you know, uh, $25,000 reward. It's kind of a love-hate relationship there. Like, you want to catch him <laughs> just to be safe. Um, watched a lot of uh, news today um, as much as I could. Uh, I think it's Nancy... What's her last name? Uh, she put it more in perspective that he's a killer, not so much, um, you know, just an escape fugitive. So it, it put me on edge today. Yeah. So you're really freaked out about it? Uh, yeah, I kind of calmed down a little bit. I had to take a nap because I was exhausted because um, the anxiety, but... Tom, you anxiety panicked about it? Uh, no, not really, but a little cautious, you know, you go yeah. outside, you look around, you make sure, like, I was going to cut the grass, but I thought, my one buddy told me, that's not a good idea, because you can't hear somebody sneaking up on you, so I'm not cutting the grass. I mean, you try to you be a You also check the buildings. Well, um, yeah, I did check our shed. Quite a few times. Um, we don't have a secure lock on our garage uh, at the moment, so um, it was a little nerve-wracking to think that he wanted, he probably wants to be high up and, you know, definitely out of sight, so. Where do you think he is now? He's hiding in those woods over yeah. there somewhere, I'm sure. There's so many spots he could hide. And what we heard, this guy hid it in the Brazilian jungles. That ain't nothing compared to here i mean seriously brazilian jungles i mean there's poisonous snakes or all kinds of spiders yeah. whatever you know yeah, yeah. but yeah so right. if he can do that he can do that. Yeah. but we also caught him so i'm pretty confident that uh he will get caught it's a matter of um how long will is he willing to hide out how much food does he have um and is he going to go out blazing which is more than likely because he seems cocky and confident so desperate to don't have anything to lose. Yeah, nothing to lose. You know the story how he escaped? Yes. Yeah, crab walked up the wall. Can you, can you tell wall. me that? Yeah, crab walked up the wall because, well, nobody saw him do it, obviously. Oh, no, there's a video. I saw Well, video. no, 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 oh, I, at but time. at the yeah. time, at the prison. Like, no, I saw it. <laughs> I saw it, too. <laughs> but uh, uh, what was the other thing about that? that? Oh, that a prisoner just, what, a month ago did the same thing, like and also it was put razor wire they, over they or something? They didn't do enough. Right. Yeah, exactly. So. They caught the prison guard with um, an illegal cell phone, which... You know. Didn't he get fired today? I have no idea. I, I didn't hear got, that. I thought I saw the it. The guy fired. in the tower who was who yeah, one I, job one was of, to... One of the guys at yeah. the prison got fired. That's what I saw. I don't know if... But those motions are supposed to be set in effect. Uh, you know, once one person escapes, you remedy the situation immediately. <laughs> you don't want everyone escaping like that. And when someone does the same thing, it's just, uh, you know, a complete irresponsibility on the prison and the guards, um, and just security in general. And now we have, you know, what, 20 times, if not 100 times the security, you know, in the area. It just doesn't make any sense to me why we would, um, you know, not try to fix it at the level of the prison. Yeah, it was just one guy didn't quite do his job good uh -huh. enough that day. Right. And he um, spent a lot of taxpayer money. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for letting me talk to you. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
All right, so that's my neighbors, Tom and Crystal. So glad this is over. Anyway, last week, before all this craziness started, um, I took a drive down to Frederick, Maryland. It was a nice three-hour drive, you know, west on the turnpike and then south on 15 down to Frederick. It's a really beautiful country down there and uh, caught up with Andy Bennett, whose new hemp company is called Heart Hemp. And they are making a big push to be the first industrial hemp company in Maryland. Uh, they're growing a lot of hemp this year, and they're working on putting in decortication facilities. Here's Andy. Well, Andy, introduce yourself for us. Uh, good morning. My name is Andy Bennett, and I'm the owner of Heart Hemp Company. All right. And tell us what Heart Hemp Company is. Heart Hemp Company is, um, in its purest form, just kind of taken off, I guess is what I would say. We're, we're, we're starting as a grassroots organization, putting some industrial hemp in the ground here in the state of Maryland. On a commercial scale, it's never been done. So uh, we're starting at a very basic level to um, put a few different varieties in the ground at a few different seeding rates to understand how this plant reacts in this area. So that as we continue to grow and ask people to grow for us, we're providing the best data that we can. All right, so where are we in Maryland right now? Right now, we are just outside the city of Frederick, Maryland, on the southeast side of the city, two and a half miles outside of the city. All right, um, it's a pretty rural area, got a lot of farmland out here. It, it gets more rural the further out you go from here. Um, this, this is what we call home. My home farm is about six and a half miles from here, and it is absolutely uh, just, just gorgeous down here. We're happy to have you here. Thanks. Um, all right, so you first commercial scale industrial hemp farm what are you growing how many acres are we looking at here we have some acreage contracted uh, in different sites throughout Maryland at this specific farm here we have just under 60 acres of commercial production now that being said uh, we have some trial uh, trial sites here where we are we're, we're, we're running density trials uh, on three different types of Chinese seed and two different types of, of French seed here uh, the French, the French varieties are more fiber forward, while the uh, the the Chinese varieties are a little more herd forward, if you will. Okay. And then, so what's the plan for processing all this? Right now, we're still vetting that. Um, when you have to put your money where your mouth is, you 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 tend to be very careful. And so, we have been vetting decortication options now for the better part of 18 months, and we're starting to narrow that down. So, our plan right now is to uh, get this stuff on the ground. We'll start. We'll start mowing it and harvesting it next week. We're going to let it ret. We're going to bale it. We're going to net wrap it, and we're going to put it in a building where we keep it nice and dry, so that by the time we get some more scale behind us next year, we can begin to decorticate. All right. So you are putting in a facility. That is the plan, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If if you uh, if you look at the state of Maryland and even in a surrounding 200 mile radius, there are no decortication facilities, and we would be lo uh, love to be one of the first to do that. Yeah, we could sure use uh, that capacity here on the East Coast. Absolutely. I see you have one of those uh, hemp harvest work fiber cut machines over there. Where'd that come from? It, it's here. It's here. It, uh, we weren't sure it was going to make it, but it did. Uh, it, it arrived last Monday. Um, they, they pulled it in here, and the Bish family was kind enough to jump on an airplane and fly out here. They got here Monday, and we ran it up until dark Monday night. Um, it, is, uh, it was manufactured by, by Bish Enterprises. It's called a fiber cut. It is three 12-foot sickle bars that is used to mow this, this hemp that we have grown here. We have anywhere from 8 or 9 feet up to 15 feet tall. And one of the pain points that I heard as I was researching this industry was the harvest piece of it, how these uh, farmers were, were getting this stuff on the ground. And, and this machine allows for us to get it down in equal lengths so that once it rets, we can bale it uniformly. All right. Um, what can we expect from the event today? What do you have in store for us? Some of the words that I'm going to share with people right off the bat is today is all about opportunity and education. Uh, we are here to provide an extra layer of opportunity for our farmers to uh, put some seed in the ground and learn right alongside us, uh, improve their soil health, improve their bottom line um, by way of a much reduced input cost. Um, the education piece here, again, this has never been done. So I'm fairly confident that as for, for everybody walking in here today that they're seeing something new and hopefully they understand that we are growing 
strictly for industrial uses. We're going to talk a little bit about the grain and fiber exemption here, the Industrial Hemp Act, which we are huge supporters of. Uh, but today is all about opportunity and education. All right, you got a lot of farmers coming here today? We have a lot of farmers. I got a lot of farmers sitting on the sidelines watching what we've been doing. They, they've been asking a lot of questions. Not all of them jumped in with us to begin with. Uh, and I understand it's, it's hard to be an early adopter in this. So we got a lot of farmers here today, and I'm very appreciative of it. Right, so how'd you get started in hemp, Andy? Yeah, sure, Eric. I, I started in an ag-based risk management and insurance firm right out of college. I was lucky, and you know, that was 24 years ago. We just started our 25th year last Friday. I, I've been lucky enough in my career here where that, that business, for the most part, is self-managing. And what that's given me uh, the opportunity to do is, is vet this plant. And so uh, once the 2018 Farm Bill released this plant to the, to the public, I started having farmers wanting to grow it. So I had to start researching it so that I could help advise them on all the risks they face on a daily basis. The problem was, you know, I couldn't really supplant that with an insurance policy necessarily because the risks that they faced came in the form of charlatans and snake oil salesmen that weren't willing to pay on the contracts that they were, you know, providing. So, um, I, you know, from there, the last three, four, five years, I've just been in this thing whole hog, man. I, I love talking about it. All right. So reaction from family or friends when you were like, you doing? Oh. have you lost your mind? Um, was the initial stuff. It took 18 months of cajoling and, and, and arm twisting to get them here. But um, my, my parents are here. My, I got family here. Um, my in-laws, uh, all my staff from my various companies, the farm, my farm folks, my managers, everybody's here and they've just been nothing but supportive. And I can't thank them enough for it. Cannabis loves community. Agreed, sir. All right, Andy Bennett, Heart Hemp Company. Thank you so much for having us out today. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I met Andy out at the Montana Hemp Summit back in July. And I've gotten to know him a little bit since then, and I really like what he's doing. I like his energy. I like his whole approach to everything. He got up and he addressed the crowd. You know, maybe there was, I don't know, uh, I did a rough count, and I, I think there was about 70-some people there in the tent that day in Frederick, Maryland. And he gave, you know, some introductory remarks. And um, he, one thing that he said that really stuck with me, he said something like, um, one thing I know for certain is that nobody here was around the last time this commodity crop was farmed in this country. So take some pride this morning in knowing that you took the time out of your busy lives to be part of something groundbreaking and positive. Yeah, amen to that. So yeah, um, super great to see what they're doing down there. Um, we just need processing capacity here in the east. So yeah, heart hemp, let's do it. All right, so while I was there, um, all right, so one of the, the speakers, so there was a handful of speakers uh, besides Andy that day, um, Erica Stark from the National Hemp Association. She got up and uh, said some things. Um, and, and then Bert James, he's a crop consultant who works with FiberX and uh, Kona P US. Um, I, I was able to catch up with him and I met him originally, uh, at NOCO this past March. So it was great to reconnect with him and, uh, here's what he had to say. Okay. Bert James, could you introduce yourself for us? Bert James, Canopy US, also worked with FiberX, uh, farmer, crop consultant, and hemp enthusiast slash supporter for seven years now. Uh, basically here to support Andy and this type of initiative in general. You know, across the country, we're seeing a lot of positive vibes, if you will, a lot of people getting their legs under them. And this is the type of example where you have a bona fide businessman, an ag industry specialist in Andy Bennett. He's got a robust network of farmers, an organized group, and he's just got the passion and the energy to make something happen. And uh, this beautiful hemp crop and field day is a part of that. And you're, you come up from North Carolina? Yep. Uh, tell me about your farm down there. Uh, well, it, this year it dried up. Uh, that's what I can tell you about this year. We had uh, a magical start. It was a late start, but we had a good crop going. And my little neck of the woods and others, uh, we just went about five or six weeks without rain beginning in 10th of July. And so we saw our crops really kind of take a beating. But, you know, North Carolina, we, we can kind of grow anything there. Uh, a lot of vegetables, a lot of potatoes, tobacco. So row crops are kind of secondary. They're kind of placeholders. And so we're kind of starting to see that model struggle just a bit. It's kind of treading water instead of thriving. And so to me, it's, it's time that we kind of introduce new crop alternatives and niche crops and that type of thing. 
uh, because things are changing and we got we got to kind of change with them. And you think hemp might be one of the crops to fit in there? Uh, I do. I think that uh, North Carolina is an example of a, a region that has a little different, more unique opportunity. Uh, we've got the textile infrastructure that did not leave uh, during the NAFTA exodus in the early 90s. And so a lot of those holdouts are, are still in place. And so we're going to pursue textile grade fiber with great vigor. Uh, obviously, other uses can can be grown there, but that's a really big focus for our region right now. And it's grown in a little bit different way than this crop here, uh, where we're actually managing the crop with a little denser population. We're more focused on the fiber, the quality, and the herd is more of a byproduct. Uh, so that's a little bit different system, and so far so good. We've got some growers doing really good. Um, I've grown now three years in a row uh, once I left the CBD game. Uh, Rick Brown is doing pretty work uh, up in the northern part of the state. So there's a lot of people that are winning, which is good to see. Uh, talking about like planting density, that sort of makes a, a, a thinner fiber, or how does that, can you talk about how plant, planting density affects the outcome? It's not unlike other crops. So the more dense the population, the more competition there is for light and space, uh, just like a soybean crop or a wheat crop. And so typically, when you plant it more dense, the crop, the crop is going to be a little bit less um, bulky. So the actual stalks will be thinner. Um, they'll be taller in a lot of examples. And they'll be less branching, which is very important in textile grade fiber. Uh, however, there also will be less yield, potentially, because with that production model, we're going to want to harvest the crop about 25 days earlier, potentially, than a herd or dual crop model. And so there's a different economic scheme that has to be figured out with that crop. Uh, you mentioned you were in CBD uh, for a little while there, and we were talking earlier. And you, uh, how did you describe it? Like the how people got into CBD in the early days? Talk yes, yes. Uh, I've, I've said this now, no telling how many times all across the country, but uh, it's a human, uh, the human nature in all of us. We, we respond very similarly to greed and then also to desperation and so between those two things coming together uh, they had a party with CBD because you know there were farmers just scratching for what's next and then there were these people from other states that knew how much money there was a flash in the pan moment in time to go just it's a cash grab and uh, you know I, I went all across the country literally telling people warning them that if we grow 200,000 acres as a country that would be enough CBD for every man, woman, and child to get a daily dose of CBD for the entire year. And I was in California at the time, and I said, you represent enough acreage in this room to flood the market. I said, please take that information and use it wisely. The farmers started raising their hands slowly. It's like, but I heard you could give it to dogs and cats. <laughs> and, and I heard that at some point we might be able to give it to livestock. And so that was that, you know, whether it was desperation, greed, just human nature, yeah. they, people were trying to talk themselves out of the reality uh, of the numbers. And I think that's what happened to that, that side of the industry. People, they were following the spreadsheet and they followed it right over a cliff. Right. Yep. I think there's a lot of things in this world that people are trying to talk themselves out of reality. <laughs> that's kind of the theme of the, the, century. the century. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think... Uh, We've got a, a huge opportunity. I think our generation, not knocking any other, I'm not part of that discussion, but I, I do feel like most of the conversations I have that are based in solutions and reality versus let's just talk about everything that's wrong. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed a lot of good conversations with, okay, we got some things to figure out. There's no question about that. But where does that conversation begin? And uh, frankly, just blowing up Andy here, it begins with the Andy Bennett. It begins with one guy with a vision who's got the, the organization and resources to, to carry it through. And I think it, the more that we do and the more that we see become reality, we'll see some problems begin to get solved by default uh, instead of nitpicking about every little thing that we can complain about and getting caught in the weeds. And you know, here we stand north of Richmond, Virginia. I think that in and of, in and of itself is an example of this hunger and this thirst for, we're tired of arguing, let's, let's start figuring let's things out. out. Yeah, yeah let's figure it out, yep. Yeah.
Uh, tell me a little bit about the work you do with Kona PUS and then with FiberX. Sure. Uh, in both regards, agronomy fo focused and based. Uh, so I took my row crop experience as a consultant and as a farmer, immediately learned what I could plug and play with the industrial hemp crop and never looked back. So I've now taken that across the country. I've seen different farmers in different areas and how they need to grow. Uh, also had a magic opportunity last year to go to France where we actually source uh, some of our industrial hemp seed from Hempit. Uh, they're the largest seed provider in Europe. And so we actually uh, had a tour of some of the farms in that region and got to talk to their farmers and how they grow. And uh, there's some disconnect. Uh, they're great farmers, but they farm like we did in the 1980s. Uh, a lot of tillage, a lot of older equipment. Great farmers, they do a great job, but just Europe as a whole is not on the same bandwagon that we are with you know, cover crops, no-till. I think they will be. Uh, I joke with my partners, I was like, we should forget him and just start selling cover crop seed in Europe because it's a thing, you know, it's, it's brand new, it's not happening. Um, but yes, agronomy focused and then as important is understanding the, the psyche of a farmer you know, having worked for them my whole life, I know a lot about how they respond to different things. And at the end of the day, it's not a really complex recipe. Farmers just like to know the truth. And whether it's good or bad, you know, you'd, you'd rather have a hard conversation and catch a little grief as opposed to sugarcoating something and then not really know what's coming. And so I've, I've been pretty good at delivering that message. Uh, and not to harp on CBD, but there were some things that we didn't know until it happened. And uh, it was kind of, some things were unavoidable. And that was an example of farmers just being too, too good at what they do. Uh, we take that market pretty quick. It did not take us long. Yeah, I think it'll be different with this side of the industry. I think if we do this well, uh, it will actually, the scale and the efficiency and, and what we can do will actually inspire industry to adopt this. And they'll know that this is real. And I think that this is gonna be a different volume game. You hear Andy speak of a commodity situation this is squarely a commodity crop. And does that mean it's gonna come in and take over cotton, soy, corn? No, it's not. It's gonna complement those rotations. It's gonna start at 800 acres, 2,000 acres at the time, and it'll take a, a, a clear decade for it to be on the, on the radar like these other crops. At, at which point, everybody will be in. In 10 years from now, the big boys will have their own seed, their own chemistry packaging, and, and everything that complements this industry, uh, but not right now. You heard it there. Bert James, thank you so much. Great to talk to you. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Love what you do. All right. That does it for the show today. A little bit shorter than normal, but like I said in the beginning, it's been a weird week. So thank you for listening. My name is Eric Herlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Check us out at LancasterFarming.com. Get yourself a subscription to our print edition. Sign up for our newsletter. Do all the things there at LancasterFarming.com. You will not be disappointed. In fact, you should check out our coverage of the manhunt through farm country of Chester County. Uh, my editorial team did a great job reporting on this, talking to farmers and telling the story from a farming perspective. I'll have a link to that story on the show page for this episode. But anyway, uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can always email me. You can send an email directly to eherlock at lancasterfarming.com or you can call me up and leave me a message, 717-721-4462. All right, until next week, I will see you in the newspaper. Industrial hemp. This episode of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2023 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show is written and recorded, edited, and produced by Eric Herlock. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow.